Já posso começar? Fantástico. Hi everyone, I'm Tiago and welcome to my brand new astrophotography channel. So on this channel, I will try to document my whole growth as, as an astrophotographer, try to add a little bit more to the astrophotography community worldwide, and also the processes that I use uh, in order to produce my deep sky images from uh, target acquisition, target selection, uh, post-processing, stacking, and so on, and provide you all with well, the most beautiful pictures that I can provide, which will hopefully be good enough for you. Right now, for our very first project, we're in here in the beautiful location of Alqueva in Portugal, one of the dark sky tourism destinations that we have in our beautiful country. Feel free to visit. Uh, right behind you, you can actually see the, uh, the castle of Regengos, and um, I'm going to try to capture two uh, big targets, the Milky Way, obvious, and uh, the, um, I'm actually going to try to frame the, the castle with the Big Dipper above. I tried it last night, came out okay, so I will try it again tonight and see if I can perfect that shot. And for that, uh, I'm going to try to use a beginner, the LCLR, the Canon 60D, which I'm using to film this. And also, one thing that I don't see a lot of is trying to use this little thing, a smartphone, uh, as an astrophotography camera. This is not uh, the best camera to use for astrophotography since, well, wasn't really designed for it. The sensor, uh, the sensor thermal noise is actually quite high and the exposures are quite limited, 10 seconds or less. So we'll have to do some stacking, take a lot of pictures and then stacking on post-processing to try to get a nice picture. So I will try to use this one also on the Canon 60D and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so past me forgot to detail the setups that we're actually going to use for it. So just going over it really quick. So for our main setup, we're just going to use a standard unmodified Canon 60D. This is an unmodified sensor straight out of the box, so nothing changed there. We're going to use the standard kit lens that comes with the Canon 60D, which is an 18 to 55 millimeter uh, lens. We're going to set it at 18 millimeter to try to get the widest field possible. We have it set up in the, um, in a modif in a standard uh, ball head and just a normal tripod that you can get online. Um, in terms of exposures, we're going for 30 seconds exposures at 1600 ISO, a 30 seconds and uh, 18 millimeter focal length star trailing shouldn't be an issue. However, we are going to use this, which is Sky Guider Pro Equatorial Mount. Uh, this is a, a travel uh, friendly uh, piece of equipment that you can just set up on top of the tripod, setting the ball head on top of the Sky Guider Pro, align it with the Polaris and you can extend uh, the exposure a little bit since we're using 30 seconds it shouldn't be too much of an issue so just so in this case this should only give us a little bit of an edge but it might be useful so we'll see how it goes now for me the really interesting part of this experiment is this so we are going to do the smartphone photos and this is just the simple setup that we're going to use we're going to use a novelty tripod that I got from my GoPro a few years back. We're using a smartphone holder that I got online for like 20 euros or something and just setting up the, the smartphone on it, just setting up on the surface and just fire away. In terms of settings for the smartphone, so like I said earlier, we are limited to 10 second exposures. The F ratio is also limited to 1.7 and the ISO gain the highest it could go is 800, so it's half of the Canon 60D, but I'm actually really curious to see how far it can go. Okay, so we're cutting straight to my editing studio, which is a fancy word for home computer. Um, some lessons learned from the, this whole process. Uh, so basically, I did try to capture some footage at night during the sessions, but the, um, the ambient light was so extremely low that the video came out dark and it's not really that interesting. I'll actually try to cut in some footage here, but it's not really that appealing. And also quite a, some time has passed since the session it is processing for 
various life reasons. And right now we'll go over to see how uh, to, uh, to, uh, to analyze the, um, the images, see how they came out, and then do some basic post-processing. So we'll start here with first the Big Dipper images. So we'll just go in here and inspect them. So you can see here, that's actually not that bad. The, um, you can actually see the Big Dipper pretty clearly. You have the castle of uh, Mossarash in the, um, in the background, and it's actually captured quite a nice field of view. If we zoom in closer, we can actually see that there is some star trailing, which is normal when you're not using any sort of equatorial mount. So the sky is drifting, uh, following the Earth's rotation. So uh, this was with the cannon, so at 30 seconds, yes, you do get some star trailing done with this. So if we go here and inspect this S7 images, you can actually see, well, that's on the side, but you can see that the sensor isn't really that Great. You have this blue tint all over, which we'll try to correct in post-processing. But at least when we zoom in, we can actually see that at 10 seconds, the, um, the star trailing is actually quite minimal, or even non-existent. So that's encouraging. So we'll see how we can process this um, after we stack all the images and try to get the best signal noise as possible. Okay, so now we're going to check the um, Milky Way images. So let's start with the S7 ones. And we can see that, again, we get this blue slash purplish, I guess, tint all over the image. Um, we get, again, very little star trailing, which is normal at 10 seconds. And when we check the Canon 60D pictures, so yeah, oh, oh, wow we actually get quite a few uh, characteristics of the Milky Way right smack in the middle. Um, and when we zoom in, we can see, well, we have a lot of sensor noise, as expected from a DSLR. Uh, we get little start trailing because I actually cheat a little bit. I use the Skyguider Pro uh, to get um, better tracking uh, and reduce the start trailing. So I'm cheating, sorry. But at the field of view, actually, if I didn't use it at 30 seconds, I don't think it would be actually quite that noticeable. So for a beginner, it might be uh, passable, quite passable, actually, uh, to not use any sort of tra uh, tracking and just go for a full 30 seconds. So now we will go for the actual processing part. So in terms of processing, we have actually quite a few options available online. The one I use the most is Deep Sky Tracker, which is actually one of me. There's a new version for download. Um, this is a free software that you can use. You also have, I believe, Sequator, if I said that right. And this is great for beginners. And myself, I'm, uh, I'm using mostly PixInsight these days, but even with PixInsight, sometimes I come back uh, to Deep Sky Stacker because it actually does a fair, fairly pretty good job at stacking your images. So now we can actually go either onto, onto Open Picture Files or I can just go here and select, let's sort by type, select all the images and then just drag and drop here. So add them on slide frames. So now here's the thing, uh, we could use dark frames, uh, flat frames, uh, bias frames and whatever, but since this is more of a beginner um, experience, uh, we're going to just go for the straight stacking of the light image of the light frames and just go from there and see how it goes. So after we have the light frames all selected, I already pre register these but if we hadn't registered it we go here to register check pictures uh, just select these if you already registered these so i take it off automatic detection of hot pixels is really good for dslrs and even dedicated astro cameras because it does a fairly good job of 
removing uh, the hot pixels without using any sort of calibration frames and stack after registering. Here we go for the star thresh detection threshold just to see how many stars it detects in the images. So 172 is actually quite a, quite a good number. So we'll go, we'll go with that. Recommended settings, just leave it as, uh, as it is on the default settings. And on stacking parameters, I usually use the intersection mode. Uh, I don't use the standard mode because uh, usually in post-processing when you do this, you actually need to uh, crop out the edges of the frames because usually when you stack a lot of pictures, there is always some sort of offset between them. And usually the edges don't get stacked as well which is normal. So then you have to crop manually. And so just to avoid that, they usually just go for intersection mode and be done with it. So with intersection mode, it just, it, uh, it just stacks the, the common areas between all the images. So you don't have to worry with cropping afterwards. We align the RGB channels and final image just to get a few more balanced uh, color and, and stacking method. So in stacking methods, I do I usually just select auto adapted weighted average. I'm pretty sure that some of you will know that oh no, we need to use this or that for for this specific purpose, which is quite valid. I usually just leave it here because well, to be honest, I'm lazy. So we'll just go with this and see how it goes. So let's do okay. Let's stack. We see that we have 11 minutes of exposures from the Canon which it's not really a, a big project so we're, we're good at using 11 minutes and we'll just see how it goes so it's not going to compute and we'll go come back when it's done so again the next step really depends on what kind of post-processing software you want to use uh, you can use photoshop you can use gimp I believe the very first program that I used, which is open source, was Darktable, um, which gave me some pretty nice results. You can check out my Instagram for those. Um, but since I already have PixInsight, I am going to use it. Now, I understand PixInsight isn't really a beginner program. And nothing can be referred from the truth, but you can actually get a, a free trial, so you can try it out. and. If you're not, uh, if you don't want to uh, to try out PixInsight, you can just go for it, whatever option you feel most comfortable with. In order to level playing field, I'm going to really try to avoid using more advanced features on PixInsight, just contra uh, curves uh, adjustments, just to bring out the more the details of what we got in our pictures. So I'm just going here, just going to open all these images into PixInsight. Okay, so actually we have some orienting issues. So let's go here to the image, geometry, counterclockwise, right? Okay, so now we got our images roughly aligned. So I actually believe I can do this, yeah. So just try to get ourselves some more room to see all the images at the same time. So here we have the Milky Way Canon and the Milky Way S7 and then the Big Dipper S7. Yeah, this one should be swapped because my OCD doesn't allow me to do anything else. Okay, so uh, in PixInsight we actually have a tool which is really useful. When we go here into the intensity transformations, we have the screen transfer function. The screen transfer function um, basically previews you what the image can look like after you process it. So let's just use it here. Okay, so we really got red because uh, the red is actually the most dominant color in the picture, which is quite normal because even in the dark sky location, you have a lot uh, of uh, background uh, light pollution, uh, which can really come into focus when you do a really long exposure. So for the Milky Way, we're doing 30 seconds exposure. So that is actually enough for whatever remaining uh, background uh, light pollution to seep into your image. So we're going to unlink our channels and oh wow, you can actually see 
the, the difference here. So we're going to use the function on all the images. And wow, I can actually say them quite surprised. So let's just close this here. Okay, so in the Milky Way with Canon, we actually got quite a lot of detail, which is very nice to look at. On the Big Dipper, same thing. So we don't have any relevant features because we're pointing to, towards Polaris, which doesn't have really any really big um, distinct feature, uh, fe uh, features like the, the Milky Way uh, arm. And when we go to inspect the S7, now we have some issues here. So you can see that it's really greenish, even when you unlink the channels. And what I'm finding is that you actually got a sort of a lens effect around the image. It's just a circular effect right here, which doesn't really surprise me because uh, I think I left in still the lens protection the little plastic that comes with the lens protection okay so we're going we could go for some color calibration but since this is mostly an example of what we can do uh, with post-processing we're just going for a straight histogram transformation so we can get this into a non-linear um, data set so and then we could just apply some curves to try to increase the contrast and see what we can see so let's just go into intensity transformations, histogram transformation. And the way this works in PixInsight is, so I come here, do the, the stretch again. I'll de I drag a new instance into the Instagram transformation and then back into the image. So yeah, it's not really a straightforward um, a mechanism. So now we get these strange colors and we hit reset and then the image is stretched as we saw in our preview. So now we're just going to apply it to all the other images. And okay, that's it. So now we can close the screen transfer, screen transfer function and also the histogram transformation and we have the, our images in non-linear data sets. So now we're just going straight for curves transformation. So we can play around with the data itself. So now we're just going to, I just open here a live preview so I can see before I commit to any edit. So now we're just going to try to increase the contrast and bring up the details. And you can see this actually makes quite the difference in showing. I could go all out, but then the image doesn't really come out very pretty so I'm just going to be a bit conservative and just try oops. just trying to be conservative and just bring out subtly the details that we want without sacrificing too much quality or exaggerating in saturation so that actually looks quite nice. So we're going to hit apply. And as you can see, our image was changed. Now we're going to apply the same to this one. So I'll just keep make reset here, live preview. And now this actually might give us a bit more work because we don't have that much. We don't have really great data. I just did blue here don't have that much great data with this sensor so we'll see what we can do with this so reading contrast that's all I'm really ready to risk actually what we're going to try to do is try to decrease a little bit oh you see that we're just going to decrease slightly the green tint just trying out various combinations but I I think the best way is to just subtly reduce the green component and actually it's not that bad. So yeah, can we hit apply and you can see 
the change which is actually quite nice so now we're going here for the big dipper so not much that we really want to emphasize in this image we just want to create a nice image to look at so we're just going to increase the arc contrasts and you see if i push this too far you get this really weird bloom coming from the background from the foreground actually so we're just going to be conservative about what we are trying to do here because we just want a nice image to look at we don't want to to win any words with this so remember if this was your, you get a thing of this if this is your first picture we don't need to win awards you just need something that you're proud to look at so, let's see here increase the contrast a bit. again let's do the green a little bit yeah that's actually quite nice So, yeah, I actually think that this is nice. So, let's zoom all of these so we can better see the results. So, for the Big Dippers, we have this result with the Canon 60D and with the S7, and with the Milky Way, we have this for this the canon 60d and this for the s7 and i actually think this looks quite amazing if this was your first attempt so that's really what i want to, to pass on to you is that you don't really need amazing gear to do this you can take a commercial available dslr or you can take your take your own cell phone and just go with it have fun with it and that's the the essence of the asset photography if you're not having fun it doesn't make any sense to do it so go out uh, take some nice pictures and just see what you can get and i actually gotta say that for an s7 i'm actually quite surprised because i really thought this wouldn't be as good um and i fully expect uh, more recent cameras to actually have much better sensors and fun fact, since since I took this picture, I have actually uh, swapped my old cell phone, the S7, for an S21. So I'm actually quite curious to see how it will go uh, going forward. So I'm actually, I will probably uh, go back and not, not the Milky Way because now it's October. So you can't really take a, a nice picture of it anymore. But yeah i will probably maybe next year i'll revisit this challenge and just uh, take another picture of the the milky way and see how it turns out so now i'll cut back to past me which was completely unaware of the amount of time this would consume and the amount of effort uh your very first youtube video actually requires so yeah i'll cut back to him and i'll see you again in the next video so that was our magnificent quote unquote attempt at doing an astrophotography target using a DSL entry level DSLR and a smartphone. Uh, I will post the final image at the end of this video. Probably a lot of stuff to improve on, but we'll see. I hope you enjoy the content. I hope you enjoy this new format. Feel free to subscribe to the channel to check out my Instagram. Links will, will be in the, in the description box down below. And until next time, keep looking up. Bye.